Thanks for the reminder. I was, uh, I was thinking on the way in that it's, it, it's easy just to walk across the street. I'm in the building, uh, building 35 on the NIH campus, which is just on the other side of Old Georgetown Road. Uh, and so it was, uh, it was good, to, uh, good to come here. It's also, uh, turning the mic on reminds me, uh, uh, just a couple of weeks ago I was interviewing a student, uh, a medical student who wanted to come uh, for a year to do research at the NIH, and he told me, uh, oh, I saw you on YouTube. <laughs> and uh, it was from this, uh, this talk last year. I hadn't uh, noticed that I was on YouTube. <laughs> so hello out there. <laughs> um, uh, in introducing this topic, also I was thinking uh, of a few months ago I gave a talk like this up at uh, Long Island Jewish North Shore Hospital, Long, Long Island. Uh, and uh, on the way there, I flew up to LaGuardia and was taking, uh, had a ride, uh, a driver uh, taking me to the, uh, uh, to the medical center. And uh, he, he was a, an engaging fellow. The driver uh, had a, a business of three or four vehicles. And he was, he was telling me the real key to keeping these vehicles operating, the key to his business really, was having a, a little device, which he showed me, a decoder device, uh, which he can plug in. Uh, to the car's computer system, and it will tell him uh, what, whatever the problem the car has and anticipate problems that that car is going to have uh, in a way that he can do something about it. And I was thinking, boy, it would be great to have something like that for people. Uh, <laughs> you know, something we can, we can just sort of plug in and get the answer, what the diagnosis is, what, you know, what uh, the risks are for developing different diseases. It will help us to manage those uh, patients. Uh, kind of like in the old Star Trek series, uh, McCoy or uh, Beverly Crusher would take a, would wave a, a gadget over a patient and it would say exactly what the problem is. But the thing is, we're, we're approaching that. Uh, we're getting to that point with genetic diagnosis. It's really, the field is really moving quickly. Uh, we're being uh, deluged with uh, genetic information, kind of like the internet, uh, but genetic information from patients. We have that capability. And what I'd like to talk about this morning is my take, and I'm not an expert on all aspects of this, uh, just uh, my take, uh, my, our experience with uh, how, with genetic diagnosis, where we are now and where it seems to be going. So uh, before I get much further, I, I, just in the way of disclosure, I, as an NIH employee, I'm not allowed to take uh, money for consulting, but that, I think I mentioned last year, that doesn't prevent people from asking me to consult. Uh, the, uh, foundations and companies are happy to get free advice. Uh, I tell them they get what they pay for, but it's uh, uh, <laughs> uh, just it, it gives to give a sense of where I'm coming from. I do uh, serve on advisory boards for a variety of uh, disease foundations: the Muscular Dystrophy Association, the French Muscular Dystrophy Association, and then uh, d a variety of disease-specific organizations. Uh, I've listed a couple here that are relevant to what I'm going to be talking about. And then I also uh, consult for companies, uh, uh, Biogen IDEC um, and uh, smaller biotech companies, uh, uh, Procensa in the Netherlands and Summit in, uh, in England that are developing treatment for muscular dystrophy. And then what I spoke about last year actually is an uh, uh, interesting experience of having done a sabbatical in industry at Novartis uh, in Cambridge. And I found out subsequently that they listed me as a co-inventor on a, a patent based on the work that I was working there. So that's something uh, is shared between Novartis and the NIH, and I may, uh, the NIH may uh, get some money from that, and I, I myself may get some money about that. I don't think it's relevant to what I'm going to be saying, but it, I think it's good to have up there as a way of disclosure. So what I'd like to talk about in this morning's lecture is uh, genetic uh, testing for neurologic diseases, how it's done. Uh, there are different approaches. Uh, traditionally, we uh, test for a specific gene that we think uh, might have a mutation that would explain a patient's problem. Uh, but uh, that's evolved to having gene panels uh, to test for a number of different genes. And uh, recently, over the last few years, to genome-wide analysis to really look at all the genes, uh, all 25,000 or so genes that we have, to see which one uh, has a mutation that explains a patient's problem. Now, as I go through this, uh, I'll give some examples. and. Uh, talk about advantages, you know, the advantages of uh, having a diagnosis for a neurologic disease uh, uh, in terms of disease-specific management and uh, prognosis and genetic counseling for the patient and for family members, and then the risks that are involved. 
uh, things to watch out for as, as you enter into this. Uh, whoa, I misprint there. Uh, the, the risks of uh, pre-symptomatic testing and uh, incidental findings, which is a kind of thorny issue that uh, there's, we're having a lot of discussion about at the NIH now and elsewhere. So this is a uh, modified version of a uh, <coughs> slide I used last year uh, uh, that shows uh, just how we go about uh, diagnosing uh, patients with hereditary neurologic diseases. It's pretty straightforward, actually. You see the patient, the patient comes into the clinic, uh, you see them in the hospital or outpatient clinic. The first step is, of course, to characterize the disease, to see what are the, what's the history, the physical exam, uh, lab test findings. Uh, what's the phenotype, is what we refer to it, the disease manifestations, and then to collect samples, uh, DNA samples, and to uh, send those samples for DNA testing, and that will give you a genetic diagnosis. Over the last 25 years or so, uh, as uh, Jean Passamani was saying, we've been very successful at identifying uh, disease genes. There are now over 3,000 human disease genes that have been identified, several hundred of these maybe six or eight hundred of them affect the nervous system in one way or another. So we have now, uh, you know, a hundred genes uh, that cause deafness or uh, more than a hundred that cause epilepsy, uh, mutations in the genes cause epilepsy, uh, uh, more than fifty that cause neuropathy and ataxia and muscular dystrophy and so on. The challenge is to sort through all that information, to choose, choose the tests appropriately and to try to uh, get the information processed in a way that would be helpful uh, to the patient's management. So <clears throat> just to uh, work through uh, these uh, different uh, steps uh, in this process, uh, in terms of characterizing the disease, uh, the first thing is to get a good uh, neurologic uh, history and examination and um, you know, for a neurologic disease. And then um, uh, this is stress the importance of getting family history. We, we all learn this in medical school, but I think with the, pr the daily pressure of seeing patients and moving them through, we, uh, for whatever uh, disorder, we're, we uh, oftentimes don't take the time to uh, find out, well, you've got this problem. Is there anybody else in your family who has this problem? Which can really give insight into what the problem is, um, particularly for neuropathy, for example. Uh, you know, if you, you see a patient who has uh, weakness, and uh, atrophy and uh, sensory loss in their hands and feet, uh, signs of uh, peripheral neuropathy. And, uh, you know, to know what the cause of that neuropathy is, it helps to find out, well, who else in the family is affected by this? Is anybody affected? If so, who? Map out the family history. And then a, a laboratory evaluation. <clears throat> and for the patients uh, with neurologic diseases, uh, there's relevant blood work. Uh, uh, for neuromuscular diseases, uh, in particular, the creatine kinase, CK, and electrophysiologic tests like EMG and nerve conduction, and then imaging, uh, you know, brain imaging, uh, uh, but uh, uh, increasingly uh, across the street we're using muscle imaging as a way to help in the diagnosis uh, of, for neuromuscular diseases. And then, if necessary, uh, nerve or muscle biopsy to get tissue uh, for histologic examination. And, uh, you know, the thing is uh, that Genetic testing is often made uh, invasive procedures like that unnecessary because you can kind of cut, a he cut to the chase and figure out what the genetic cause of the disease is without having to look at the tissue. But sometimes we still do. Okay, so then you've evaluated the patient, uh, what's involved in sample co collection. I just wrote this out last night <coughs> uh, to make a couple of points. Uh, they, the samples are collected for DNA. And uh, uh, that's uh, remarkably easy to do. Uh, you can get DNA from any, any kind of uh, cell or tissue. Um, you, uh, typically, we can just draw one tube of blood, uh, anticoagulated blood, uh, to extract the DNA from the white blood cells. But it can also be done by saliva, having the patient spit into a tube, uh, or do a, a, a kind of a mouthwash to collect uh, DNA from the mouth, the cells in the mouth. Uh, or uh, from old, you can get DNA from old tissue samples from a, a microscope slide of a, a, a patient uh, who died a long time ago if you need it. Uh, uh, DNA is very stable at room temperature. We, you know, typically we'll throw it in the, in the fridge at uh, four degrees centigrade, but, uh, you know, the DNA has been extracted from, uh, oh, you know, remains of mammoths and Neanderthals that's been out there for, in the environment for thousands of years. So 
the DNA you get from patients is very stable uh, uh, for weeks or months, uh, years. Uh, and very small amounts are needed. Uh, you only, to make a genetic diagnosis, you can use DNA from one cell, uh, picograms of, of DNA are, uh, are, are, can be used by amplifying the DNA and, and using it. So it's a remarkably stable substance and you need very little. I guess we all know that from crime stories now. Uh, um, and uh, sometimes uh, if, if it, there is a hereditary uh, disease in the family, it's helpful to get samples uh, from other family members to see whether the sequence variants you find in the DNA are tracking with the disease in the family. Uh, let's see, okay, one, one joke slide. If, if nothing, it's nothing, uh, go back to sleep. I was just getting a DNA sample. It shows a, uh, uh, I don't know, maybe this doesn't go over real well. I tried it on my wife last night. She didn't like this. <laughs> it's, uh, it, sh it shows a, a woman with a, uh, a mouth swab, uh, you know, just collecting a sample uh, of DNA to find out what, uh, what kind of genetic uh, problems her, uh, her husband or boyfriend might have. Uh, I, well, I'll move on. <laughs> I, I, used a, uh, I, I gave a talk at the University of Chicago some years ago. I don't know if anybody's been there, but uh, afterwards uh, somebody came up to me and said, we don't do cartoons here. <laughs> said, okay. <laughs> okay, enough of that. <laughs> okay, so then you get the DNA sample, you get a blood sample, then the, then the thing is to figure out, well, where do you send it? Uh, and I don't want to... Uh, uh, you know, put in plugs for any particular lab, but uh, uh, one resource, resource that's uh, particularly useful is uh, uh, now run by the, the NIH, the Genetic Testing Registry online. It's a listing of all labs that do uh, genetic testing and by what tests are done in which labs. Uh, it used to be, uh, it was started at the University of Washington as gene tests and it's been subsumed by the uh, uh, by NCBI and the National Library of Medicine uh, across the street here. So it's, it's a good website. Uh, if you just uh, Google on genetic tests, that, that'll, that'll come up uh, as a way to figure out where to send samples. Uh, just looking back over the last uh, couple of months, the places, the labs that we've used uh, recently uh, uh, are, you know, there are a number of good labs available. There are actually uh, dozens or hundreds of labs available around the world, but uh, for different tests, but uh, for neurologic diagnosis, uh, for neurologic diseases, uh, Athena Diagnostics in Massachusetts is particularly, uh, has a lot of tests available in prevention diagnosis and uh, a lab in Atlanta. And uh, GeneDx right here in uh, Gaithersburg uh, uh, is good. And in terms of knowing how to use these tests, uh, there are resources available online that are quite, quite good just to give information about genetic diseases and uh, particularly neuro, neurologic, hereditary neurologic diseases and, uh, you know, and how to get uh, tested, which, which tests are appropriate for which patients. Uh, gene Reviews, I mentioned, uh, was set up uh, at the University of Washington in Seattle. O OMIM, uh, Online Mendelian Inheritance in Man, was uh, started by Victor McCusick at Johns Hopkins University, it's still maintained. It's information about every hereditary disease, uh, human hereditary disease. Uh, in a way, organized in a way where you can scan it. If a patient has deafness and vision loss, you can get the long list of uh, diseases that would cause that combination of uh, findings and know, know how to test for them. And then uh, for neuromuscular diseases, a website we use, I've used a lot uh, <laughs> to see a patient and then go to look on the computer to see what's going on, uh, set up by Alan Pestronk at Washington University in St. Louis, a comprehensive uh, uh, website about neuromuscular diseases that uh, is, is very user-friendly, uh, I find. Okay, so just like to run through some examples now about how, <clears throat> how we do or how genetic diagnosis is done for uh, hereditary neurologic diseases. I think a good place to start is with the disease I talked about last year in terms of about development of treatment is uh, Duchenne muscular dystrophy. Okay, here's a uh, you know, very characteristic uh, clinical uh, disease, uh, a very clini a characteristic clinical uh, presentation for this disease uh, that I uh, described last year. I don't know if we see many children here at Suburban, uh, but uh, uh, you'll see families uh, who are affected by this disease fairly often. It affects about one in 3,000 boys. <coughs> um, it comes on in the first uh, few years of life, uh, onset usually around age three or four, uh, progresses. 
gradually. It affects, it causes weakness of the uh, proximal muscles, so the shoulder and hip muscles. And then over a period of years, it affects other muscles. Uh, uh, eventually, the boys become wheelchair bound around age 10 or 12. Uh, it starts to affect respiratory and cardiac muscles, and, and uh, patients uh, will die from the disease in, the, uh, in their 20s, usually. And it's an X-linked recessive disease, so it's, um, yeah. I was thinking last night of putting together a, a, just a, a pedigree to show X-linked recessive inheritance, but it, it, it is uh, a disease that affects males. Uh, so boys are affected. Uh, their mothers, sisters uh, are, can carry the disease gene without showing manifestation. So it gets passed from, can be passed down through families affecting only the males uh, with, uh, with women uh, being carriers. And uh, it means that the, uh, the mutation uh, gene is on the X chromosome. And this was really one of the first, if not the first, gene to be identified uh, by positional cloning back in the 1980s. Uh, it was, it's a particularly large gene on the X chromosome and encodes a protein that, that, that has the name dystrophin. So the patients have mutations, usually deletions in, in the dystrophin gene that leads to a loss of dystrophin in the muscle. And uh, uh, this uh, causes the muscle to degenerate. Uh, so uh, there are characteristic clinical features of this disease. If you see a boy with this problem uh, uh, or see a family member, uh, to get the to get the history of the affected individual. Uh, you look for it, you can look for the characteristic features in terms of the age of onset, the distribution of weakness, the X-linked inheritance. They have very high creatine kinase, usually in the thousands. And then, if they get an EMG or muscle biopsy, they show signs of my, myopathic features, so uh, muscle uh, degeneration and regeneration, and uh, on the biopsy. But nowadays, uh, we can just go from the clinical features, uh, maybe the family, the, the pattern of inheritance, high CK, go directly to genetic diagnosis. So we don't need to do muscle biopsies like we did in the, in the old times or, or even in EMG. So the, the test here is targeted on a specific gene, the dystrophin gene on the X chromosome. And as a first pass, you really look for deletions and sometimes duplications of parts of the gene. So it's a really big gene, uh, more than two million base pairs, 2.3 million base pairs. It takes up about 1% of the X chromosome. It's broke, the gene is broken up into coding regions called exons, separated by non-coding DNA called introns. And uh, the patients are usually missing one or more of these uh, exons. Uh, and uh, the test is just to look to see by polymerase chain re reaction, a PCR, uh, which of these exons, are, whether, whether the exons are present or, or missing. And uh, this test is present, it uh, shows, shows the abnormality in about three quarters of patients. To go beyond that, to, to, to get at the others, uh, there's a more involved procedure, sequencing the whole gene, um, which used to be pretty laborious, but now is pretty, pretty straightforward. It's just kind of expensive. Uh, and that will add another 15%. So genetic testing will uh, di give you the cause of the disease confirmed uh, clinch the diagnosis in about 90% of patients on, on a blood sample or, or even a, a, a saliva sample. Now, um, uh, the cost uh, for uh, self-pay patients, medical costs are all over the place uh, according to the, what your insurance is and, uh, you know, who, who's paying for it. Uh, insurance will pay, in my experience, will generally pay for this kind of testing. If you have to do it as a self-pay, it's about $500 for the uh, uh, deletion testing, but it can run up to uh, several thousand dollars, uh, two, two, two or three, uh, four thousand dollars to do uh, sequencing the rest of the gene. Uh, but again, it's, it's usually covered by insurance. For those patients, we're still wondering about the diagnosis uh, and the genetic testing is negative. You can go ahead with a muscle biopsy and do dystrophin immunohistochemistry, and that will show the loss of dystrophin and nearly all, basically in all patients. Uh, uh, so that's a backup if you really want to, really want to establish the diagnosis. Uh, so why, why do the diagnosis for this disease? I mean, you see the kid, it looks, looks like uh, Duchenne muscular dystrophy. Why, what's, the, what's the advantage of being sure about the diagnosis here, uh, knowing exactly that this is, this, this is a patient with Duchenne muscular dystrophy because there is an identifiable uh, 
mutation in the dystrophin gene? Well, I think it helps in the clinical management. There is treatment. It's not, a, it's not an untreatable disease by any means. Uh, uh, it's been well established that steroid treatment helps. It makes the kids stronger. There's a, it delays the progression of the disease. Uh, but steroid treatment comes with a lot of side effects. To know before you start the treatment that you're treating a disease that's known to respond to steroids, uh, not something else, is, is important. So uh, uh, steroid treatment and then also uh, kind of supportive care. The kids, uh, optimal treatment of Duchenne muscular dystrophy involves cardiac and pulmonary and orthopedic support. Um, oftentimes they'll benefit, they develop scoliosis and benefit from spine surgery. Physical and occupational therapy and assistive devices to have a well-fitting wheelchair. It helps to know, uh, you know, to, with this particular patient that this is the diagnosis and this is what you have to look forward to in terms of the disease prognosis and to tap into the wealth of uh, information about how to properly manage the patient. So um, uh, then the other thing, as I mentioned earlier, is carrier genetic counseling uh, to offer carrier testing. We oftentimes uh, over the years have seen, you know, families with a patient who's affected where there's a sister or a mother who really wants to have, you know, who wants to have more children and really does not want to have another child with this kind of condition. So we can see whether, whether or not they're a carrier. Actually, this came up in my own family just a few weeks ago. Uh, my cousin's son married a woman who has a brother with what sounds like uh, Duchenne muscular dystrophy, and they're trying to get, I talked with them about getting it diagnosed to see whether, she, whether my cousin's uh, wife is a carrier. It makes a lot of difference about how they go about uh, planning, their, planning their family. The same kind of testing that's used to Diagnose the disease can be used to identify carriers and to do prenatal testing. If people want to, if someone becomes pregnant who's a carrier, to, to do uh, the diagnosis very early in the pregnancy. And I, another advantage, I think, in knowing exactly what we're dealing with in a patient like this, with this kind of disorder, is to give them the opportunity to enroll, to connect up to the resources that are available, enroll in patient registries, uh, MDA clinics, uh, for example to get involved in clinical trials and support groups, uh, uh, not only the MDA, but Parent Project for Muscular Dystrophy. Each of these diseases has a group of committed uh, uh, patients and families to connect to if, if, the, if the patient you're seeing is so, so inclined. Okay, so that's Duchenne dystrophy. I can go on to talk about another disease that's you know, a bit more complicated, actually a set of diseases that goes by this fancy uh, eponym, uh, Charcot-Marie Tooth Disease. Uh, so basically what's meant by Charcot-Marie Tooth Disease is hereditary motor and sensory neuropathy. This is what I was alluding to earlier. It, the, the names come from uh, two uh, French neurologists back in the 19th century, uh, Charcot and Marie, and a, and a British fellow named Tooth. It's not a, it's not a dental disease. It's a, <laughs> uh, that's just the names that stuck since they described it back in the, in the 1880s. Uh, what this causes is progressive uh, distal weakness and sensory loss. Uh, it, uh, so it causes uh, weakness of the hands and the feet, uh, atrophy of the muscle, loss of sensation. I say, you know, that this is a pretty common disease. Uh, for a hereditary neurologic disorder. It affects about 1 in 1,200 people overall uh, in Europe where it's been studied. So if that holds up in this area, here in the Bethesda area, there are probably about 50 or 60 patients with this disease. You, you'll see them walking down the street if you're careful. They'll have a ten, uh, tendency for their feet to drop. It, uh, uh, one thing that really helps in way of intervention is uh, to, just to provide uh, uh, braces, uh, uh, molded ankle foot orthosis that, that helps with the foot drop. Um, and otherwise, it's a pretty benign disorder. A lot of people don't even know that they have it. Uh, um, uh, it's uh, a big family we had up from Pennsylvania, uh, the Pachati family, and said, oh, that's just the Pachati foot problem. <laughs> you know, it's, uh, it's just the way the, their feet are. Uh, it usually doesn't affect life expectancy. They usually live out uh, normally productive uh, lives. Now, so this characteristic uh, uh, phenotype or characteristic pattern of disease manifestations uh, uh, has a broad variety of genetic causes. So with Duchenne muscular dystrophy, there's one gene you're talking about, the dystrophin gene. Here, the same disorder, uh, there, there are about 78, last count, uh, 78 different 
genes uh, that can be mutated to cause this problem. Whoa, <laughs> that, that, that's a diagnostic challenge. <laughs> so uh, how do you approach this? Well, first, uh, the, the, these different causes of Charcot-Marie Tooth disease or different types of Charcot-Marie Tooth disease fall into two general categories according to whether the problem is, uh, wh what, what the underlying problem is. So this problem is caused by degeneration of the nerves, uh, the hereditary disorder that causes degeneration of the nerves. And uh, there are two basic ways that the nerves can degenerate. Here's a, uh, a nerve cell, axon, uh, in the peripheral nerve cut in cross section. And here's the axon. It's wrapped in myelin by a Schwann cell. And uh, <clears throat> you can get Charcot-Marie Tooth disease. Some, the majority of patients with Charcot-Marie Tooth disease have a loss of myelin. It's a demyelinating uh, disease. And then uh, a minority, um, maybe uh, 40, 30 or 40 percent, have uh, type 2 uh, or axonal degeneration. So you can tell the difference by looking at the nerve. You can also tell the difference with less invasively by doing nerve conduction. Type 1, demyelinating Charcot-Marie Tooth disease or slowing of nerve conduction. Type 2, axonal uh, form of the disease, there's a reduction in the amplitude. So any, anybody with, uh, who can do a nerve conduction study can, can differentiate type 1 and type 2. So then in terms of the genetics, how did all these uh, 78 different genes, it, well, it turns out that there are really four that account for the majority of patients. Uh, there's uh, type 1A, type 1B, uh, there's an X-linked form of it, and then there's type 2A. So uh, two dominantly inherited demyelinating diseases, uh, an X-linked uh, X-linked form, which is kind of mixed demyelinating axonal and then uh, an axonal form of type 2A. Uh, actually, type 1A accounts for about 60 percent of patients. Uh, that's caused by mutations in, that affect a gene called PMP22. After that, probably the X-linked form is most common, uh, gap junction protein, GJB1. Uh, and then uh, the uh, type 1B and, and type 2A, which have mutations in myelin protein 0 and mitofusin. So, so, you know, if you just look at these four, you're going to get most patients. Uh, uh, the others uh, get to be pretty rare, you know, so if you say after these four, it falls off so that, that the other mutations at most account for, uh, you know, just at one or two percent of uh, patients. And then you get down to a lot of mutations that have only been identified in one family or two or three families. And I'll give some examples here. Uh, yeah, this, this slide doesn't show up real well, but uh, uh, this is uh, the way you can see the mutation that causes uh, the most common form of Charcot-Marie Tooth disease, type 1A. And what it does, what it is, is a, a duplication, not an internal uh, deletion or duplication like you see in the, the dystrophin gene, but here the whole gene is, is duplicated. It's having an extra copy of this PMP22 gene, and you can do that by uh, looking at uh, blood cells under the microscope and la using fluorescent labels for the gene, you can see uh, that the patients have an extra copy of the gene. Uh, normally, uh, there's one copy on each cr chromosome. It's on chromosome 17. Each copy of chromosome 17 has one copy of this PMP22 gene, but in patients, there's an extra copy. So instead of seeing two uh, red dots, you see three. So uh, it's, you know, it's a bit of an involved diagnostic test. It'll give you the answer most of the time, particularly if there is a, if, if you know that the patient has a demyelinating form of Charcot-Marie Tooth disease with a slowing of nerve conduction. The genetic diagnosis of all the others, the other relatively common uh, forms and all of the rare forms is done by DNA sequencing. So how is that done? Well, you know, uh, companies, a, a number of the companies that offer genetic testing will offer uh, gene panels so that you can uh, test for, or they can, <laughs> test for, uh, you know, a number of different 12 or 15 or 20 different uh, known causes of Charcot-Marie Tooth disease. If they hit the top four, then they're going to catch most of the patients. But the more they test for, the more comprehensive uh, the diagnosis is. It helps, I think, in, uh, if, if you're going to go with gene panels to know, first of all, whether it's type 1 or type 2. This limits the options, uh, but it's still possible to get genetic testing on a gene panel for all, all of the, the uh, 
known CMTs, or the large majority of them. This, is, this has been really expensive. You know, it costs, uh, so like with Athena panel for type 1 uh, or type 2 CMT, well, it costs more than $10,000, $12,000 to get all the CMTs up to $18,000 or so. So it's a pretty, pretty expensive way of going about it, checking each gene individually. So the real approach here, uh, which is gaining traction, is to do genome-wide analysis, to look at all the genes with new techniques that are available, to look at all of the genes, all 25,000 genes, and then to pull out of that information the 78 genes that are known to be affected. And that's much less expensive. On a research basis, we do that test across the street here. It started out a few years ago, it cost us about $10,000 to do all 25,000 genes. Then, uh, over the last few years, it came down to $2,000, $1,500. Now, uh, just in the last few weeks, it's come down to $500 to do, uh, to do um, get sequence information on every one of the genes. So it's, it, it, it's really amazing how the, the, the uh, cost of this has come down, and it's, it's done very efficiently. We do it on a research basis up at uh, a, a, a center uh, through the Genome Institute called NISC. Uh, but it's also becoming commercially available. So it's something you can get on any patient. Uh, the cost, the commercial costs are much higher because it has to be, meet uh, CLIA standards, uh, uh, clinical grade standards. But uh, genome-wide analysis is really changing the way we approach patients like this. So oh, uh, just here's an example of a, a patient where we uh, found, our family where we found a, a rare uh, form of uh, Charcot-Marie Tooth disease. Uh, uh, a family up from Pennsylvania. We had collected samples from this family. I, I was at Penn before I came to the NIH, and we collected samples from this family back uh, uh, in the 1980s, I think, uh, or a long time ago, uh, at least more than 20 years, 20, 20 years ago, and had, had just had them. Uh, we, we didn't see any uh, abnormality uh, when we first collected them, uh, and we just had them stored in the cold room here. and. Uh, uh, you know, when this new uh, genome-wide analysis uh, became available, we, uh, we pulled the samples out, the DNA samples out, and uh, sent them off for testing. We had previously, well, so what this was is a, an unusually severe form of Charcot-Marie Tooth disease, uh, axonal, so type 2, uh, and X-linked recessive. And these, pa these patients in this family, and there were uh, six or I think eight uh, different males affected with this disease in the family had the severe axonal neuropathy so that they uh, barely could walk even as children, and, and uh, with it they had deafness and uh, cognitive impairment. Uh, we looked on the X chromosome and mapped it to a particular region of the X chromosome uh, just using markers, uh, genetic markers in that region of the chromosome to a particular part of the chromosome that had about 40 or 50 genes. And then we used the new, new technology a couple of years ago to uh, screen through all those genes and uh, found a mutation <coughs> in a gene uh, called AIFM1. It's a mitochondrial protein that induces apoptosis. And uh, so, you know, at the time it was, it was great. Actually, it was a little, <laughs> a little interesting uh, in dealing with the family. We, we, we found the mutation uh, and then we said, oh, boy, maybe we should reconsent the family <laughs> uh, before publishing it. And uh, so it looked, uh, had the family names and then called back. I looked on the internet to see if we, only one of about 20 or so family members was, could get their contact information on the internet. And I called up this woman um, in uh, Bucks County, Pennsylvania. Her husband answered the phone, and he was a little skeptical about someone calling from the government about a genetic diagnosis. But uh, he eventually handed the phone to his wife, and she said, oh, Dr. Fishbeck, we've been waiting to hear from you all these years. <laughs> you know, they're, really, they're, they're really pleased to know exactly what the cause of the problem was. And there's some therapeutic implications here, a uh, possibility of treatment based on this, what's understood of the bio biochemistry here. So it just shows how the, the new technology gives us a new, a fresh look at, uh, at diagnosis in these patients. It really enhances our capability. And then, uh, you know, here's an interesting article. It was in the New England Journal a few years ago uh, from uh, Jim Lubsky at ba Baylor College of Medicine, a geneticist there who is himself affected by Charcot-Marie Tooth disease. And uh, this made an interesting story for the New England Journal. It was, um, <clears throat> he decided to uh, do this new technology on his own DNA. Uh, he had never had a diagnosis before. It, it ran in his family, uh, affected. 
you know, his siblings and uh, mild manifestations in, one, in his father and his grandmother. And what he did is uh, whole genome sequencing. So not just the coding regions, but he, he arranged uh, at Baylor to have all of his DNA sequenced, all three billion base pairs, and uh, sorted through all the variants. So in his own DNA, there were three million variants, and uh, started to look to see which of those variants were shared by other family members, which of those variants could make sense uh, as, a, as a charcuterie tooth disease gene. And he found uh, a variant in uh, SH3 TC2, uh, which is, had just been identified as a rare cause of uh, axonal uh, Charcot-Marie tooth disease, and that he uh, and his fa other family members had variants in this gene that were tracking with the disease in his family. So this, this got uh, some publicity. It was in the New York Times and uh, a wide, widespread publicity as a new approach to diagnosis, not by looking one by one at specific genes, but by looking at all the genes and extracting from that uh, the information that gives you the diagnosis. So what about this new genome-wide analysis? Uh, and again, I'm not an expert on the technique or how it works exactly, but just how, how it's used or how it, it can be used. Uh, there are two different uh, approaches. One is called whole genome sequencing, which is sequence all three billion base pairs of DNA that we carry, like was done with the Human Genome Project. The cost of that has come down uh, pretty dramatically, but it's still, it's still difficult in that it gives you a lot of variants that need to be sorted through. In, in Jim Lovsky's case, three billion variants to try to figure out which of those is, is causing the problem. So another approach that's used a lot more widely now is called exome sequencing. So that's just sequencing the coding regions, so the exons, uh, all of the exons of all the 25,000 genes. Uh, it's still a lot of information, but it, it's more likely that you're gonna, you get a somewhat more manageable uh, uh, list of uh, variants to sort through. The challenge here, uh, it's a challenge in, in Jim Lubsky's family, and, the patient that we saw, patient I showed you, and others that we see, is the, uh, what it, it pushes the problem. So sequ DNA sequencing is not limiting in this at all anymore. You can get sequence from all of the genes, the coding regions of all the genes, or all the non-coding regions if you want. Uh, the challenge is to confirm the pathogenicity of the sequence variants that you find. So which of all these different variants is, is the cause of that patient's problem? So you know it's. Uh, and there are different ways we can go about doing that, um, uh, but it's still pretty laborious at this stage. Uh, one, is, one is easiest is if the gene has already been reported, like in Jim's case with SH3TC2, uh, that the gene mutations in this gene are already known to cause the disease. So okay, that solves the problem. But if, if you don't see that, if you want to see, well, you have a novel variant, you want to see if that's the cause. Then, then it takes more work. And one thing is, and this is back to what I mentioned early on, that it may be helpful to have samples from other affected members of the family for comparison to see if the, if the, the variants are, what we say, segregating with the disease in the family. That just means that they're, the variant is uh, present, is tracking th with the disease down through the family. All of the affected individuals have that variant, and the unaffected siblings do not. Uh, that's called segregation. And then another thing that's useful here is to look to see whether the variants you're finding are present in healthy individuals. Because if they are, they're probably not causing the disease. And uh, Les Biesecker at the Genome Institute's uh, done some work to just collect samples from uh, healthy individuals around Bethesda, uh, over 500 healthy individuals, uh, to get uh, control information for comparison. And something. You know, this, this is rapidly evolving, and, and, and it's an important thing to do. The uh, Heart, Lung, and Blood Institute has put together uh, uh, exome sequence uh, data from uh, over 6,000 uh, individuals, and it's available online in a nicely searchable uh, form on their, uh, uh, on their website. Uh, so you can, if you see a variant, a, a list of variants, you can sort out those that are unlikely to be causing the disease because they're present in other people uh, who don't have the disease. And then beyond that, you can look to see whether these variants look at the equivalent gene in other species, like in mice or rats or fish or worms, or flies. And you know, many genes are conserved across species, and many sequences are conserved across species. If the variant that you see is uh, in a, a uh, 
uh, at a site in the DNA which is otherwise conserved, then it's, uh, it's more likely to be pathogenic. If, if it's not, then it's less. And then finally, and this can take a while, is to look to see what the effects of the variants are on the protein structure and function. So this is really done now on a research basis. I think, you know, the tests are clinically available. It's, it's a very powerful way to uh, identify known, known variants. Uh, and, uh, but beyond that, it gets to be more of a research thing at present. But this is evolving. I think this is going to become uh, increasingly available uh, on a clinical basis. Uh, Inova Fairfax in, in Virginia is ad advertising exome sequencing uh, on NPR. There are ads uh, uh, that they'll, they'll do it for you. But it's, it's, it's still a lot of work to extract that information, uh, extract from all the information you get, the information that's meaningful to that patient. So it, it really helps to have you know, people who know, know how to use it, a genetic counselor at least, and, or, or geneticists to, or specialists in the, in the area of the disease to kind of sort it through. But it, it's a rapidly evolving uh, field, and I think the support will come to be able to do this. The more information we have, the more straightforward this process becomes, the easier it becomes. Well, I'd like to say a little bit here about uh, repeat expansion diseases. It's something we've been involved in a long time, for a long time. Uh, identifying and characterizing these diseases. Uh, this is important, and when it comes to hereditary neurologic diseases, it's uh, important to know about uh, diseases that are caused not by deletions or point mutations, but by expanded uh, simple se sequence repeats, uh, usually trinucleotide repeats. There are about 30 of these diseases that are now known, and nearly all of them neurologic. Uh, and. Uh, in many cases, the expanded repeats are unstable, so that as it gets passed down from, through families, that there's a tendency for the repeat to become, which is already expanded, to become longer from one generation to the next, and that uh, results in increasing uh, disease severity, a phenomenon we call anticipation. Now, one of the more famous of these diseases is Huntington's disease. Uh, this affects, uh, affects about 1 in 15,000 people, so there'd be a few people around, around Bethesda with this disease. I think I've seen them on the street. It, it, uh, uh, it causes chorea, uh, these uh, jerking movements, uh, and uh, psychological changes and cognitive decline. They become demented. Uh, <clears throat> they have a kind of impulsive behavior. They're prone to suicide, uh, depression, uh, which is important to keep in mind. Uh, uh, something like 15 percent suicide rate, I believe. It, it's caused by, uh, de it's a neurodegenerative disease caused by loss of neurons in the basal ganglia or striatum, uh, the caudate nucleus in particular, but also elsewhere in the brain. And the cause of this disease is an expanded uh, trinucleotide repeat on chromosome 4. Uh, it's the cytosine adenine guanine, so three nucleotides are repeated in this gene, and the, 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 the uh, repeat becomes longer. The gene was given the name uh, Huntington. So here's the Huntington gene. It's also a large gene, uh, like the dis not as large, but similar to the dystrophin gene. And here in the first exon of this gene is this CAG repeat. In normal individuals, about 20 CAGs, CAG, CAG, CAG. And in patients with Huntington's disease, it's expanded to 40 or 60 or more CAGs. This CAG, so it's three nucleotides encode one amino acid. CAG encodes the amino acid glutamine. So this is, encodes a polyglutamine repeat in the uh, Huntington protein. So this is, is, a, is called a polyglutamine expansion disease. Now, in terms of families <coughs> it's, uh, and diagnosis, it's very easy to look at the length of the repeat uh, in the DNA uh, from a, a sample from a patient or family member. Uh, he, this is done by uh, PCR, polymerase chain reaction, to just amplify that part of the gene that has the repeat, and then run the product out on a gel. The normal repeat varies in length. I, I said about 20, but it ranges from about, oh no, 13 to 30 or so uh, CAGs. And you so, the, here it's on chromosome 4. You see each copy of chromosome 4 has a different, um, a different repeat length. Um, it, it varies a lot in the normal range. But the patients who are affected here, so the, the shaded symbols uh, are uh, affected individuals in this family. Uh, the squares are males and the circles are females. The shaded symbols show those who are affected, and we see that they have a longer 
uh, CAG repeat, which gives a band that runs higher on this gel. And you see, it's interesting. See here, so this guy uh, had a, uh, an expanded uh, CAG repeat of about 40 CAGs, and he passed it on to his children, his affected individuals, and they, uh, it shifted in length. It got, it got longer uh, in some of these individuals, up here up to about 60 or so in the youngest son. Uh, so you see the instability here. This guy, the youngest son, had onset in childhood. Uh, he, the father, had onset in, uh, you know, in the late 30s, uh, after he'd had most of his children, I guess. And, and uh, uh, so you see that there, even within this family, there's a correlation between repeat length and age of onset. The longer the repeat, the earlier the age of onset in this disease. But I want to focus on this person here. See, this woman uh, who has affected brothers and a sister she has a, a long CAG repeat, but she's not, she's not affected by the disease. At least she's not affected by it yet. So this is what we call a pre-symptomatic individual. Somebody who's got the mutation and is at risk of coming down with the disease, most likely will, or almost certainly will, but she doesn't, she doesn't know it yet. And she doesn't have any signs of the disease. There's a, co a correlation here, as I said, between repeat length and age of onset. So uh, but there's a lot of variability. Um, you know, here's the normal repeat in, in these individuals, about 1,000 patients from uh, uh, Vancouver um, studied some years ago. You can see that as the, repeat length, uh, as the repeat length gets longer in this direction, the age of onset gets earlier. But there's a lot of variability. So in any given individual, it's hard to predict. I mean, you, you can predict that they will come down with the disease, but it's hard to predict when. Uh, they may not come down with it. They may come down with the disease in their 20s, or they may not come down with it until their 80s. We had a patient, uh, a retired uh, Washington, uh, uh, D.C. police detective who was di diagnosed in his 80s, uh, started to develop these jerking movements, and his girlfriend's girlfriend bought him in. He said he's just not dancing the way he used to, <laughs> uh, and it, it was. It turned out to be a, a late onset form of Huntington's disease. So it's hard in any particular individual who's asymptomatic, at risk, to know for sure uh, when they're going to come down with it. And uh, there are lots of psychosocial risks with pre-symptomatic diagnosis. You're taking a healthy individual who has uh, affected family members and uh, offering, or you can offer, a test to show whether or not they're, they're carrying this gene. And uh, it turns out that most people in that situation would opt not to, not to know. They'd rather not you know, because there isn't any specific treatment here, they would opt not to know whether they're going to come down with it or not. And uh, so I think when you encounter somebody like this, uh, somebody said, oh, my father died of Huntington's disease, and, I, you know, I'd kind of like to know whether I got it. it you know, it, some people it's very empowering to know. Other people don't, don't want to go there. But it's important for somebody to sit down with them and talk it through. And genetic counselors are made for this. Uh, you know, I think it's, uh, it's really good to engage. I mean, it's, it's important to engage a, uh, uh, a genetic counselor before you send the test. I mean, it's easy to just send the test off to one of these companies to get it done. But to, to get counseling, uh, genetic counseling, psychological counseling, to make sure the patient knows what they're getting into uh, before and then when the test results come back, whether they're positive or negative, to kind of uh, help, them, help them through this process. Now, this is notorious for Huntington's disease, and it's particularly important for Huntington's disease because of the high suicide risk uh, and other psychological problems these patients can get. But the same kinds of considerations really apply to other, other uh, late-onset neurodegenerative diseases, and there are a lot of late-onset neurodegenerative diseases where this could apply. So, you know, I would call Huntington's a polyglutamine uh, expansion disease. There are other diseases with the same kind of uh, mutation, same kind of mechanism that affect other parts of the nervous system, like the spinocerebellar ataxias, cause loss of coordination. Kennedy's disease, a, a motor neuron disease that has the same kind of mutation. Uh, that same kind of concerns about presymptomatic diagnosis apply to these, but also to other late onset neurodegenerative diseases with known genes, like Alzheimer's disease or Parkinson's disease uh, or ALS. Each of these uh, diseases, the most patients, uh, we still don't know what the genetic cause is, but there are genes that have been identified. Frontotemporal dementia is another one. Uh, we saw a patient a few years, or a person, not a patient, a few years ago, a woman 
uh, who found out that she was at risk for frontotemporal dementia. Her father had died of it, and somebody just, somebody out in Nebraska sent her a letter saying, oh, you know, you've got, you could have this uh, genetic defect that causes you to become demented. Uh, a lawyer from Charlottesville, and she was, she was really kind of up <laughs> and distraught about that. And we, we did testing for her and found, that, found out that she did not carry it. She was very, very happy to know she wasn't. But I think in, in dealing with patients, people like this, it's good to make sure they get good genetic counseling or psychological counseling as they go through the process, because it, be, it can be a challenge. Okay, the last thing I wanted to talk about here are incidental findings. We've, we've had a lot of talk about this recently, as I said before, but one thing you encounter as you get into genome-wide analysis is you've, you come up with mutations in genes that you're not looking for uh, uh, that could be important. So um, call these incidental, unexpected incidental mutations. Uh, if you're looking at all 25,000 genes, all of us are carrying mutations uh, in genes, uh, and some of them are important to know about. <laughs> and, uh, so some of them could have uh, therapeutic implications. Uh, for, for example, breast cancer uh, or colon cancer. It, if you have a mutation, even, you know, so you, you get tested for, I don't know, Charcot-Marie Tooth disease and you find out that you have a gene that predisposes to breast cancer or colon cancer, it's, it's arguably it's good to know because uh, it, it affects whether you get mammography, whether you get uh, uh, mass, you know, prophylactic mastectomy. For colon cancer, it, affect, it has an effect on how often you get colonoscopy. Uh, uh, the, the, there are therapeutic implications with these findings. And so uh, there's a lot of discussion about how this should be handled recently. The American College of uh, Medical Genetics, ACMG, last year uh, published a list of 56 genes where mutations should be reported to the patients. And uh, mutations in these uh, particular 56 genes, mostly cancer genes like these, uh, have been showing up in about 2 to 3 percent of uh, exomes. So, you know, it, it's something, you know, we're still struggling with exactly how this should be handled. Should every patient who gets exome should, should somebody look at these 56 genes? Should that be required or should it be encouraged? Uh, we're, have, we're having a series of meetings to uh, try to work this through. But I think, I, I think standards, this, this is the start on establishing standards on how to deal with this situation. So, so it's important to be aware of. If, if you're going to go to Inova Fairfax and order exome sequencing, to know that this could happen, that you could find something you're not looking for. It's, in some ways, it's analogous to getting an MRI scan of the brain and looking for one thing and finding something else. Um, um, and, uh, you know, we're, we're kind of learning from the radiologists as we go along uh, to some extent. But, uh, you know, there's a lot that needs to be worked out in terms of the strategy here. So in closing, I'd like to, I, you know, <laughs> I think as clinicians, I'm still very much a clinician at heart, uh, we like to uh, trade, uh, tell stories. and. Uh, <laughs> my, I was saying, my wife, uh, my, my wife will sometimes say to me afterwards, you know, you really didn't, like, it, you start to talking, uh, you forget that as a physician, it, what you're talking about may not be interesting or pleasant for somebody else to hear about. Uh, this came up. I was talking uh, about metastatic prostate cancer, uh, and my wife said afterwards, you know, that's not really dinner table conversation. <laughs> but, you know, we learn from each other, I think, in sharing stories. And I, uh, when I was putting this talk together, I uh, went back and he, uh, to a, a story that uh, is from several years ago that uh, um, I, I think is worth retelling. So uh, this is a patient we saw at the NIH, you know, some years ago, 17-year-old girl complained of uh, progressive difficulty walking. It started when she was little. Uh, at age five, her right foot turned inward. At age seven, she was seen by a physician. She had mild weakness of the arms and right leg and deformity of the right foot. She got an MRI scans of her head and spine were normal, and she had an EMG that looked like it showed some changes of myopathy uh, uh, in, the, uh, in the leg, uh, the peroneus muscle in the leg and the, and the biceps muscle in the arm. And then later, uh, she uh, required braces, uh, like I was talking about for Charcot Marie Tooth disease, for progressive deformity of the feet, and she fell frequently, difficulty throwing a ball. Exam uh, showed that she had a, uh, a kind of a funny smile, a transverse smile, normal muscle tone, uh, 
She had weaning of her shoulder blades, her scapula, and proximal weakness of the arms, uh, foot deformities, normal sensory exam, and hyporeflexia. They got a muscle biopsy. She was seen at a, um, <laughs> my wife said I shouldn't say which one. She was, she was seen at a major uh, academic medical center by a real expert in, uh, in neurogenetics, and uh, uh, she was given the diagnosis of uh, uh, fascio-scapulohumeral muscular dystrophy. Uh, so it's a form of muscular dystrophy that affects the muscles of the face, the shoulder blades, and the upper arms. Uh, there's a picture of a patient. So she didn't look like this, <laughs> but uh, this is from, uh, I think from Alan Pestronk's uh, website at, at Washington University, St. Louis, showing uh, FSH dystrophy causes weakness and atrophy of the, uh, of the face and the shoulders and the upper arms. And that's what she was thought to have um, so uh, later, uh, at age 15, she could still walk a short distance from car to school in the morning. She could no longer walk that distance by the end of the day. So it's varying over the course of the day, which you would not expect for muscular dystrophy. At dinner, she had difficulty raising her head to eat and was extremely slow to complete her meal. She used a wheelchair for all but short distances, and she began to have episodes where her legs stiffened up and locked. And then a, a diagnostic test was performed. Anybody have any ideas? Well, this is a hard one. <laughs> After all, the expert at an unnamed uh, major medical center <laughs> uh, couldn't figure this one out. But somebody, uh, an astute clinician at the NIH did, it wasn't me, <laughs> uh, one of the fellows, I think, uh, thought of the test to do. And uh, what the test was was to give her a, a low dose of Cinemet, uh, L-DOPA. So her, her um, Family history, I think also <laughs> good, to, as I mentioned earlier on, to get a family history here. She did have an affected sister uh, with this disorder, which turned out to be what we call dopo-responsive dystonia. Rare disorder, but remarkably treatable uh, hereditary neurologic disease. With the one dose of Cinemet, this girl who had been severely disabled by the disease uh, since she was 17, since she was five, gradually progressive. With one pill, uh, she was normal. It, it completely uh, did away with all of her disease manifestations, and it was a sustained improvement. Um, so uh, in her family history, uh, a sister who was affected with the same problem, and then other family members who were uh, affected with Parkinson's disease or other clinical symptoms consistent with this diagnosis. So what is dopo-responsive dystonia? Um, I hadn't really heard of it so much before we made this diagnosis, but it, 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 it's not, a, not that uncommon. It's a childhood onset disease that causes dystonia or ab abnormal stiffness of the muscles, uh, usually involving the legs, but it can, it can affect other parts of the body. And other family members, other people carrying this gene can have Parkinsonism, spastic paraparesis, or what looks like a myopathy. Characteristically, it varies uh, over the course of the day, as, as this uh, patient did and it can respond uh, dramatically and, and with a sustained response to low doses of Cinemet, the drug that we use for Parkinson's disease. Now, the mutations are known, uh, the genes are known. Uh, I haven't updated this slide, but uh, uh, there, I went and gave a talk about this at the famous academic institution where this diagnosis was missed. They didn't seem to appreciate it very much. <laughs> but the, uh, uh, it's uh, the GTP cyclohydrolase, uh, Autosomal dominant disease, uh, back when we saw this patient, about 85 different mutations, uh, and we found a mutation in the family. Or uh, tyrosine hydroxylase, both genes that are involved in, uh, in the synthesis of dopamine. So these are both important enzymes in dopamine uh, synthesis. Uh, so, you know, giving uh, L-DOPA, uh, as in Parkinson's disease, but much more dramatically uh, helps patients with this disease. And, uh, whoops. Where am I here? Okay. The, the, just the important thing to remember here is that, or to be aware of, I guess, is that dopa-responsive dystonia is an important uh, disease to diagnose, and it's a treatable. So, it, you know, when you look, for, look at all these genes, sometimes you come on to something like this that's imminently treatable and really, really does a lot of good for the patient. The patient or family are very appreciative uh, when you can do this. Okay. Uh, so this is the kind of thing, a kind of treatable disorder that could come out of a whole exome sequencing if you're doing it, uh, you know, if you thought she had muscular dystrophy or even if you thought you did whole exome for some other reason, uh, it's good to know that there are mutations in this gene because it can really uh, mean a lot in terms of the management.
take home lessons. Uh, genetic testing is rapidly evolving as a diagnostic tool. We're, uh, we're entering in a, into a new age here where we're going to have, uh, have this information available, whether we ask for it or not. Uh, people uh, have uh, their direct to consumer um, testing services like 23andMe that are offering uh, you know, genetic testing. And it's, it's really an evolving, a, a changing playing field. Uh, people are going to come to us with a list of mutations say, which of these fits with my diagnosis? And, uh, the testing allows comprehensive diagnosis of hereditary neurologic diseases with important implications for clinical management. Presymptomatic diagnosis should be done with care, and related to that, incidental findings are going to arise from genome-wide analysis, and it's important to have a strategy. Uh, we're working on that, uh, but it's important to have a strategy for dealing uh, with, uh, with this kind of thing. So it, I, I like uh, this quote from a Shakespeare quote. Uh, uh, applies, I think, to genetics in general, and particularly gen genetic diagnosis. The which observed a man may prophesy with the near aim of the main chance of things, as yet not come to life, which in their seeds and weak beginnings lie and treasured. We're, uh, we've come a long way. I, you know, I think uh, in, in uh, genetic diagnosis and things are moving very rapidly. Uh, it's hard, it, it is hard to prophesy where things are going to be five or ten or twenty years from now. but. It's going to be different, I think, in, in terms of di diagnosis. I think we're going to be a lot closer to Beverly Crusher with her scanner or, or the uh, car uh, mechanic with his decoder that he can plug in. Um, uh, and we have to learn how to deal with that. Thanks. Uh, yeah, yeah, you know, so uh, I'm not the, I'm not the uh, MS expert. There, there's some other good people across the street you could bring over to talk about MS in general, like Vivi Bilikova, for example. Uh, but, you know, retroviral uh, integration is something that can cause mutations and can, can cause problems. Uh, you know, it's something uh, that was a, a problem with gene therapy uh, in, in Europe, in France, uh, for example, that uh, in trying to deliver genes, if if the delivery system is going to put that gene into the genome, it can, cause, it can cause problems by integrating into the genome in such a way that it could cause a genetic problem, particularly cancer. Uh, you know, integrating into a tumor suppressor gene or an oncogene can, can bring out a, a malignancy. And so there's been a lot of work in gene therapy field to try to avoid that, you know, to try to use viruses that don't, don't integrate. I don't know if that answers your question. Um, I'm, not, I'm not sure about the MS explanation. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. So it, it can uh, have an effect on something that's already there. Actually, you know, it's interesting. The FSH dystrophy story, in terms of the mechanism, is uh, interesting because what uh, it's uh, the mechanism has just been worked out in the last year or two uh, as being a kind of activation of, of genes that are latent uh, in, in on chromosome four. Um, uh, it, that may have arisen from retroviral insertion. Uh, so that, uh, the DUX4 gene is uh, left over from an ancient retroviral insertion that gets activated in patient, <coughs> patients with the disease and causes muscle degeneration. So it's an interesting mechanism. A quick question on Huntington's. Does the length of the repeats also presage a truncation of the clinical course that it gets really long onset death? Yeah, it gets more severe. Um, yeah, it's not as good a correlation, but uh, the disease is definitely more severe the longer the repeat. And that's true for the other repeat expansion diseases. Uh, in addition to finding, say, a gene that can be responsive to a medication, do they ever find, like, there's a family of the Milan factor with a very high HDL, that they don't get coronary disease? Are they able to manipulate the gene so you can use that preventing heart disease? Ah, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, you know, you can, you can use the genes in both directions. Uh, 
Actually, you know, on that list of 56 genes to watch out for for incidental findings is not the HDL but the LDL receptor, where mutations cause high cholesterol. But uh, for HDL, you know, I think the whole idea of identifying good genes or good variants is something that's well, you know, it came up at a symposium we had across the street here just a few days ago. One way to do that is to look at elderly, healthy people, uh, you know, to see what genes they're carrying. <laughs> you know, sort of the opposite of looking at patients with the disease. What are the variants that uh, predispose to health uh, and longevity? And uh, there, there's some projects going on in that direction, too. Uh, collecting samples, like, f from people in Italy, uh, in, in villages who are in their 90s without showing uh, any kind of physical disability. And that, and that can lead to a number of different approaches to treatment for the rest of us. <laughs> yeah. I'm sure Dr. Fishback would be delighted to answer your individual questions. Yeah. Thanks. Good to be here.